record now. So again, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this round table on using citizen science in higher education. I'm Jennifer Shirk. I am the interim executive director for the Citizen Science Association. And just offering a brief introduction before I turn it over to our hosts and leaders of this today. Um, we are the Citizen Science Association, again, a member-driven organization that connects people around one shared purpose of leading citizen science projects in many different contexts um, across many different disciplines. Most of our webinars that we offer are led by our working groups and our community. And I will say that this is a group from which I suspect we'll see some new leaders emerge for our education working group. Um, we have groups that touch on a number of cross-cutting topics, including ethics, integrity, diversity, and equity, law and policy, research and evaluation, and there's more that you can find on our website. I want to give a quick shout out for some upcoming events. Um, you'll notice on the right that this particular session will be followed up by some more specific depth in key areas of using citizen science in higher education. And if you're not already signed up for those virtual happy hours, I know Heather will be sharing more as we go forward. There are two other upcoming sessions, one on um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and a particular shout out for one coming up on Thursday. That's a Citizen Science Association partnership with members of our ethics working group and uh, one of the folks on this call, Karen Cooper at North Carolina State University, which is the launch of an effort to build trustworthy data practices and co-creating efforts to understand the ethics behind doing um, effective citizen science that attends to ethics. All of our webinars are archived. Um, this one, at least portions of it that aren't in breakouts, will be on our YouTube playlist and you can find our whole series there and we'll send a follow-up link to that after this session is over. And I'll just say that again, with our webinars being hosted by members of our community and across our working groups, um, we turn to our members and our attendees to support the infrastructure and the platform that make these possible. And the best way to keep these webinars free is to support them by becoming a member. Or if you're in a position to do so, uh, we invite folks to chip in a little bit and pay it forward for others through a, a quick donation. And there's a text to donate link there. And we'll also share that at the end. But at this point, just a quick couple of housekeeping items. We are a big group today. Um, and thank you all for uh, paying attention to the audio and keeping yourselves muted where possible. Because this is a round table, we're set up in a way to facilitate sharing later on. And we'll be talking a little bit about the chat and the logistics of using mute and unmute as we go through this because we're going to be splitting out into several different sessions here and we'll tell you more at that point. Um, but at this point, I am going to turn it over to Heather Vance Chowcraft to really kick us off into the topic at hand today, using citizen science in higher education and all of the depth in which that's being shared. So Heather, um, I'll let you introduce this session and let me know if you need me to stop sharing my screen in order to be able to share yours. Great, thank you. Let me just share my screen here. And thank you to the CSA for making these logistics work. So thank you all for being here today. We're very excited. Um, and there's a whole lot of people who have come together to make this possible. And I think you'll hear a lot of exciting ideas from a lot of very interesting people, not myself, but everybody else will be very interesting to you. Um, let me see here. Why is my slide not advancing? There we go. So we're gonna try and keep to a tight schedule so that you can, um, so that you can be assured that we're gonna try and get you out on time. And so we have our welcome and a little bit of background information. And then we're going to launch into some examples of using citizen science in undergraduate courses. So you can see some case study examples. We'll think about things that you should consider for implementation, some resources and tools, and then we're gonna move into breakouts. Um, and then we're going 
to come back together as a large group and report out and try to wrap up. All right, so as Jennifer said, I am Heather Vance Chowcraft and I am a faculty member in biology and our STEM collaborative for research and education at East Carolina University. I'm also one of the PIs on a research coordination network called the Use SITSci network, which encourages the use of citizen science in undergraduate courses. And so um, I'll wrap back that a little bit at the end. Okay. So just so we're all on the same page, we thought we should start with the definition of what is citizen science. And so we're going to use the National Academy of Sciences definition, which describes citizen science as projects that involve non-scientists in the processes, methods, and standards of research with the intended goal of advancing scientific knowledge or community action. And so it's basically using scientific uh, methods and processes in a way that benefits the greater good, either through scientific knowledge or community action. And I wanted to point out here that this doesn't mean that you necessarily use the entirety of a citizen science project. You might just be using part of it. And it also, um, but it also means that a citizen science project is different than like an inquiry lab in that a citizen science project has information available to people outside the class itself. So it's not a, a project that an instructor creates that's only used by that class, even if that benefits the greater community somehow. This is something that's open beyond, beyond the class. And so our objectives today are to describe the objectives that can be met by using citizen science in undergraduate classes, to give examples of the various ways citizen science has been used and the outcomes that have resulted, and provide you with real world tools and resources for implementation. All right. Um, the other thing I will say is that we are going to have a lot of time for Q&A at the end, where we're trying to have some time of Q&A at the end. Um, you're always welcome to put things in the chat, but we're going to largely move through um, and save those comments from the, and questions from the chat at the end. But I'll try and summarize those questions so that we can wrap back around to them at the end. Now, I would like to pass this along to our first example of the use of citizen science in classes by Colleen Hitchcock. Hi, everybody. Um, greetings from Boston. So my name is Colleen Hitchcock. I'm a faculty member at Brandeis University in the biology program and environmental studies program. And I have had the good fortune to um, be at a place where I've been able to experiment with using citizen science in just about every single one of the courses that I have taught. Um, most of the experience that I have with SITSI projects tends to come through the lens of ecology or environmentally focused projects. Um, and I've experimented with using citizen science as a single assignment to uh, highlight or complement course content, um, using it for professional development, and to explore the primary literature. And as you'll see on our next slide from my partner at Brandeis, even as the focus for an entire course. Um, the ways that this is typically aligned with my learning objectives vary depending on the course, um, but there's definite, <clears throat> excuse me, opportunity for, for you to develop objectives that focus on doing research, gaining skills, gaining knowledge. Um, it can include things like course objectives, such as increasing student awareness around science, um, the contributions they can make now and into the future, how their work can extend beyond the university, and how engagement can be in service um, of others. And assignments can be, you know, they can range from kind of one-offs to engagement over several weeks to complement content, uh, semester-long research, or even to fostering and developing community events and local partnerships. The example I wanted to share with you is from my intro ecology course, um, which typically happens in the fall up here in Boston. And one of the things that the students engage in is they do phenology research, where phenology is the study of the seasonal timing of life cycle events. Um, and they also, and they do that through the National Phenology Network and then also Monarch Watch. And one of the things that I've learned by having kind of this complementary uh, project that goes alongside our course 
is it provides students, there's no lab with the course, but what it really does is it provides students with a common experience um, and a way to contextualize the ecological science that we're exploring in the course when most of my students are from around the country and about 10 to 20 percent per semester are international students. Um, so the experience by having, you know, a couple dozen trees tagged on campus um, provides a unifying experience for them to kind of explore the literature, to explore how to do research, and then to share out their results at the end. And that's kind of what you're looking at across these photos here where you see the students brainstorming in the beginning, um, students just releasing butterflies for Monarch Watch, and then at the end kind of doing a quick poster session based on some jigsaw. So there's really some nice opportunities to complement what you might already be doing in a class. With that, I'll hand it over to Rachel Theodoro, who is going to uh, share some more about our course and some opportunities that she's had with students. Thanks, Colleen. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rachel Kramer Theodoro, and I teach in the uh, teacher education program at Brandeis. And I'm um, I am a, a elementary school teacher and ESL teacher by my major background. So, um, <clears throat> and been in, in uh, teacher education at the university level for about um, ten years now. Um, but I met Colleen, and we had been thinking about, or I had been thinking about, how can I provide a more robust um, science course that would satisfy the requirements for particular elementary educators um, as a science preparation course uh, to then go on for their licensure and do other coursework at the university. And I wanted it to be something that aligned more closely with the next generation science standards. Um, we call them in Massachusetts the Mass um, uh, Science, Technology, and Engineering Standards. Um, and um, I wanted it to be something that really had rigor and relevance and coherence, these three strands, and not to just be an experience of learning more content. No offense to all you science educators out there. Um, but I really wanted this to be a practical experience that could inspire, that could in, um, invest in particular elementary ed students who often say that they're not science people, and I'll talk about that more in my breakout session, um, but that they will find um, passion and capacity in, in doing science and real scientific research. So anyhow, Colleen and I got together and we thought we would engage uh, folks who are both science majors, um, could be education majors or minors, and those who we called advocates. And these were anybody in environmental studies, health science and social policy, or other areas of advocacy. And we united these three populations in our course. Um, and what we found was through each of their specialty uh, skill sets and interests that together we could bolster um, learning around citizen science. So from the education background, we contributed pedagogy. Some of you know about backwards design theory and we were able to say that um, you can map out a science, citizen science project from a backwards design perspective, looking at goals, looking at intended outcomes, and you can help forward the efforts and the outcomes of any citizen science project by looking through it with that particular lens. Um, we also wanted our, our educators, again, to be really um, investigating what makes for deep, long-term learning in science, meaningful learning. And that was a broad investigation that this fall we had a pretty incredible experience with. Um, we looked at um, social justice in, in science education, and a lot of people talked about zip codes being part of the, the conversation of what made for a robust experience in, in learning to, to be an educator, a uh, science educator in particular. Um, and we had a number of different um, speakers that came to our course, um, in particular about informal education and uh, formal K-12 education, talking a little bit about how to engage more people as seeing themselves as science people in the spirit of both personal and community um, of growth and development. Um, and I mentioned earlier um, that I wanted my education students in particular to see how learning um, in citizen science can really fulfill the promises of next generation science standards um, and so on. Colleen and I also a few years ago um, sponsored a professional development workshop for um, K-12 educators who wanted to see how to again move from static um, um, sort of uh, de depositing knowledge about science into the K-12 classroom into the more of a broad-reaching, long-term, applied version of learning science. And so we had a, a nice um, professional development session with uh, K-12 teachers, helping them transform from a static experience to a more dynamic experience. Um, 
But something that Colleen and I have seen over the years has been that um, our students really support one another. So um, we've seen how our science students can help deepen um, education students' capacity to talk about data, to, be, to investigate their questions, to um, report on um, on data and, and, in ways that sound like a science person. And it really strikes our educators as incredible that they're as capable as their bio and chem and other um, colleagues. And we have so many other stories that both of us could share, but I will hand it off to the next person and I'll see some of you in the breakout session to talk about teacher education, K-12 education, and citizen science. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Hurlbert, and I am a faculty member at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I have not used citizen science um, in a classroom, but I am the founder of a citizen science project, which has been used in a large lecture class at UNC. And so I uh, just wanted to take a few minutes to give you an example of how um, how this can be done in a really large lecture class. So Biology 101 at UNC, actually there, there are two sections and there are 250 to 300 students each. And, um, you know, Colleen hi highlighted a few minutes ago that the flavor or the way in which you um, choose to incorporate citizen science in a class um, can, it can just take a lot of different manifestations. So this is, at one very much one end of the spectrum, these large lecture classes. And of course, Biology 101 has, um, I mean, it is forced to cover a really broad range of content. So uh, no one project, citizen science project or otherwise, is going to take up um, a large fraction of the course syllabus, right? So in this case, citizen science was used to cover a very small section of that syllabus, basically. Um, so I'm an ecologist. Let me briefly describe the project that um, with the, the students participated in. It's called Caterpillars Count. Um, I'm an avian ecologist in particular, and I'm interested in, in patterns of uh, bird food and how seasonal, seasonal timing of bird food varies from place to place, how bird food varies uh, across different host plant species and things like that. So this project at heart is just getting people outside, looking at branches and recording bugs and describing what kinds of things they're seeing and how much they're seeing. So this in Biology 101, this basically um, was wedged into uh, this pretty small unit on biodiversity, biodiversity and ecology. And the, the overall, you know, goal to, I guess the fine scale objective was kind of to make biodiversity a little bit more tangible by thinking about the diversity of specific arthropod groups and getting them actually outside and seeing these different kinds of groups, learning to identify them. Uh, and then topically, in this case, we were interested in covering, you know, we're introducing students to the idea of phenology, this idea of seasonal timing, anthropogenic change, uh, species interactions in food webs, kind of tying all these things together all within this one project. Colleen also mentioned, um, you know, getting students some experience with data collection, better understanding, you know, what it actually takes to collect meaningful data, um, how you have to think about that. So in this case, the protocols have all been worked out, but, you know, you have to emphasize that they have to follow these very specific protocols and um, for, the, for that data to be meaningful. And of course, for I think many students, the idea that the data they themselves are collecting is actually helping um, address or answer some real scientific questions can uh, be especially engaging. Um, and lastly, our goals in using the project, or I should, again, I should say I'm speaking for the instructors here, but um, I think one of the goals of the instructors was to give more practice in interpreting figures and data, things like that. Um, so, so let me give a sense of exactly, you know, how time was spent here. And I mentioned again, this is, I think, pretty much 
as as minimal as you could go in terms of incorporating citizen science. So really, it, it involved one and a half lectures, uh, out of class preparation by the students in terms of homework reading and reading and doing um, guided questions on that reading and exploring the project website. So students have some homework, they have a lecture in which they're kind of introduced to these ideas of um, genealogy and artifact diversity and how it might be important for birds and, and this sort of thing. Um, then they have a second homework assignment, which is actually to go out in groups and actually do these surveys. And so this is uh, both a challenge and an opportunity, and I'll talk more about this in our in our breakout session later. Um, but it's a challenge; it could be a challenge logistically when you have 300 students to make sure, first of all, everything is set up on campus for them to go out and, and do these surveys. Um, you need to specify what branches they're supposed to be looking at if you're going to be repeating this um, semester upon semester. Um, but the opportunity, right, is that you're potentially impacting hundreds of students who are opening their eyes to the possibilities of science in a new way, I think. Um, and the way it worked in this particular large lecture class is that the instructors already had students assigned for the whole semester. They were assigned in teams of two to four students. So they were already used to working in groups. And so we basically used those existing groups. We assigned those teams to work together and go out and find um, the survey branches they were assigned to, uh, work together to do these surveys, et cetera. And that was all on their own time as homework. And then, um, you know, again, with that many students, we didn't want to tag 300 branches across campus. So we tagged, you know, a smaller number of branches, um, but some of those branches were getting, so we basically had to figure out the logistics of when to tell students to go and do those surveys but that also meant that we were getting snapshots of this what on the survey branches at different points in time and then they could use the tools on our project website which is linked here on the slide um, we have all these data visualization tools so that's where they got some practice both visualizing and exploring the data they themselves collected but being able to compare um, their results to what was found in other places around the continent um, we, in addition, as part of a, a project actually that Heather has spearheaded in terms of evaluating the utility of, of incorporating citizen science, we assigned pre and post tests um, to kind of see what kind of knowledge gains students um, got over the course of that exercise. So anyway, I will uh, be happy to expand more on some of the challenges and also to talk about other ways to implement citizen science in large lecture classes in our break in a few minutes. Hi, um, my name is Chelsea Krieg and I'm going to talk about something a, a little bit from a different perspective um, in a way. I am not a scientist. Um, I am uh, so some of you have signed up for the breakout session for citizen science and non-STEM courses. So that's really um, what I'll be talking about, kind of looking at science from uh, maybe a different perspective and how to use citizen science course, citizen science activities um, in different ways in the university classroom outside of science. So I predominantly uh, teach English 101 academic writing and research at North Carolina State University. Our courses are kept small, even though it's a large university. So we have, you know, kind of the opposite of what Alan was talking about with these big giant lecture classrooms. Um, we have a uh, cap at 19 students. So um, we do that uh, for a couple of reasons, um, but mostly to keep uh, our one-on-one -on -one engagement with students um, you know, possible uh, in the writing process. And uh, a little bit about how we design English 101 that's gonna be relevant to this um, kind of conversation is that we are writing in the disciplines course, or if you've ever seen the label WID, which means um, that we are a course that uh, privileges teaching students about different kinds of audience-centered write writing um, by looking at the discipline. So um, other English 101 curriculums have different models, but this is ours that works really well at a largely STEM school, which NC State is. Um, so 
in our, um, our writing in the discipline courses, one of the things that we look at is obviously the natural science being one of the, the major course disciplines and a lot of our students are, you know, going to be participating in that kind of writing in the future. Um, but for someone who is a non-scientist myself, who is trained in rhetoric and writing um, and those kinds of things, and I can sort of explain how to work through understanding, um, you know, sort of the, the rhetoric aspect of a science text, um, that science text is not, uh, you know, I'm not in the lab, I'm not, you know, participating in these kinds of things. So citizen science felt really um, like a great connection to me for helping um, my students kind of engage, um, who are also non-scientists, uh, predominantly freshman students, um, engage in sci understanding scientific concepts and working with scientific data and material. Um, so a little bit about the project that I teach, um, uh, which I call a popular accommodation and rhetorical analysis, which basically just means that um, my students participate in public science type writing. So um, they are thinking about how to take scholarly information um, and make it more digestible for a popularized audience, um, which is really valuable in helping them kind of understand that material and also um, connect that material to, you know, these, these very important research initiatives that scientists are working with to a larger audience. So where citizen science comes in is that I ask students to participate in a citizen science project that they choose from. Um, and, you know, I have a curated list, but they often come up with really interesting projects that they found through SciStarter, which um, I know uh, Caroline's gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, they perform scholarly research on a topic that relates to that citizen science project. So um, this could just be topically, right? Maybe uh, if caterpillars count, um, and Alan was kind of alluding to some of these things um, before, maybe we're gonna look at, you know, bird, mig bird eating patterns and how they are kind of rel related to something like caterpillars count, um, or they're doing a citizen science project um, on Alzheimer's disease and stalls and rats brains and how that's kind of connected. Um, so they might find some research articles on stalls and mice brains and how, you know, kind of connect that to their citizen science project. Um, and then they take that research and uh, sort of use it as, um, as a, a logical appeal uh, to help students or to help the public understand why that citizen science project is valuable. Um, sometimes they find articles where that citizen science project is already being researched. There's a lot of material where, you know, these, uh, these citizen science research articles are already being, um, you know, sort of uh, examined in the scholarly world. Um, so sometimes they find that or different kinds of information. And then they use all of, you know, they use their experience, they use the research articles that they found. Um, and try to sort of cater that to a specific audience um, who might be interested in citizen science as a way to persuade that group to participate in that project. Um, and we're actually kind of working with uh, the SciStarter audience to start to publish some of these papers um, on their blog from some of my students, which is, which is really exciting. Um, so it's been a great learning, learning tool for my students. They've really um, enjoyed it. I even had a student tell me that she switched her major entirely to conservation biology because of the project. And this project is only a fourth of my class. Um, so it's not a, a, huge, um, a huge overwhelming um, portion of my course, but it does a great job of really helping them to work through scholarly scientific data um, and also uh, to think about how to uh, connect citizen science um, initiatives with sort of a, a larger global initiative or research initiative. Um, so, it, you know, I'll talk a little bit more in my breakout session about um, some of the other opportunities that I've really gained from this in the writing classroom. Um, and I look forward to seeing some of you uh, hanging out with me there. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Karen Cooper. I'm at North Carolina State University. And I'm um, also on the steering committee of the U's uh, SITSI uh, Research Coordination Network. Um, I have a citizen science project called Crowd the Tap that has lesson plans for educators um, for grades 9 through 12 and also for undergraduate courses in chemistry and environmental sciences. Um, I included a citizen science project, um, one of the iNaturalist projects, in an undergraduate non-majors science elective that I teach with about 250 students. Um, and I run the citizen science campus program at NC State um, in which we use the SciStarter higher ed uh, portal, which 
will be covered in more detail in a little bit. Um, I was just going to go over a few things to consider um, when implementing citizen science in a higher ed classroom. So I've just outlined a few things here I'll go over. Um, first of all, to all instructors, do a trial run of the entire project, right? Some projects, no matter how hard we try, they have glitches. Um, and your students will have questions for you that you will only know how to answer if you have already done the project. So, um, so be sure to do it first. And also, as important, is communicate with the project leader, right? Let them know that your class is going to be doing this, the project. Um, because project managers really can do a better job if they, the, with the more information they know about the volunteers in their project. So, um, yeah, so be sure to let them know. Now, alignment. Um, with the course learning objectives. What I mean here is that, uh, well, for some of you might know me, but I'm like constantly promoting citizen science for solving all the problems of the world. But even I recognize that an assignment of submitting data to a project won't automatically turn a student into a scientist. So you really need to map your learning objectives to uh, lesson plans that will guide the learning that you want to have happened in the from that project experience. So there's a lot of um, sort of scaffolding with the lesson that, that you have to plan out. And I think we'll talk about that in some of the breakout sessions. Um, so, so some of the things that, that I'm mentioning here are related to the goals of the instructor, some are more related to the goals of the project, and some related to the interests of the students. So this one about supporting citizen science project goals, is just that it's important to recognize that when you, if you assign a citizen science project to students, you're adding volunteers to a real science project. And that project will have particular goals, and you just want to be sure that you're not doing anything that might inadvertently undermine some of those goals. Um, some projects are designed to have really large volumes of data. Others have super advanced protocols that rely on very specialized no knowledge. And the motivation of volunteers really can influence data quality. So I guess what I'm saying is that lessons should just really emphasize the project goals to students. And uh, when I've included citizen science in my classes, I've emphasized making sure students understand about research integrity. And I say that it's part of student conduct because they all understand academic misconduct. So bad data is a form of academic misconduct. They need to take it really seriously. Which relates to this other one about creating appropriate incentives and sort of the grading system. So you will need ways to assess student learning um, and just recognize that some of the ways um, that you might at first be inclined to assess that learning could inadvertently create incentives um, sort of for bad data or academic misconduct. Um, like if, if you were grading based on the number of submissions, right? Like how many photos someone could add to iNaturalist or things like that might, um, might not be the best approach. Uh, the next one is encouraging, so this relates to that too, encouraging attention to data quality and the sort of scaffolding that might be needed. So um, what I'm saying here is that um, that it's probably never just best to assign a citizen science project, but it's important to build these lesson plans around it, to scaffold and to prepare the students so that they do learn when they do finally are participate in a project. Um, like I said, we'll talk more about the scaffolding and aligning with objectives um, in some of the breakouts. Um, another thing that's important to consider is like how you're gonna verify the student activities in a project. So in most circumstances, you'll probably need some way to know that the student has actually participated in the project. Now, like I, I mentioned, I use um, the SciStarter.org higher ed portal for that. It's designed specifically for keeping track of contributions that volunteers make to different projects. Um, but there's other options too. I know instructors that ask students to take screenshots of like, there's the data that they're submitting to projects. Um, 
you might also be able to coordinate with project managers to get that verification from them. So again, it's another reason to communicate with the, with the people who are running the projects that you want to use in your classroom. Um, so all those examples so far were kind of about um, protecting the project goals or um, the course objectives, but there's also things to consider really about sort of um, protecting the students. Um, because what's great about citizen science is, is that it's, it allows you to bring students out into a real world experience. What's challenging about it is that you're bringing students out into a real world experience. So just recognize that when students join projects, they are sharing information, right? Personally identifiable information, information about who they are, about where they are collecting data. Um, and they're sharing that with a project and with the wider world. And projects really vary quite a bit in how they handle data privacy. And so it's, it's just another important thing that you need to consider um, when choosing a project and presenting it with students. And related to that is whether or not you really are requiring joining of a project, right? So irrespective of how a project handles data privacy, um, consider uh, yeah, that your assignment is most likely requiring students to like create a new account with some external entity. Right, so uh, it's probably important that in your lesson plans, you consider alternative options so that students can opt to maybe not do that project, but to do something different. Um, and then I guess related to that too, are considerations related to disability accessibility. And so the need to um, be sure that you can offer alternative comparable options um, should a student need that. And I know we're getting behind time, so I'm gonna call that a, a wrap <laughs> with these things to consider. I hope they come up in, some of these things come up for more discussion in the breakout sessions. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Stanton. I am an academic librarian at Arizona State University, uh, where I support the school for this, Future of Innovation in Society. Uh, I'm also uh, part of the SciStarter team, uh, working very closely with SciStarter founder uh, and School for the Future of Innovation in Society, Professor of Practice Darlene Cavalier. So I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the role of academic libraries in, in uh, citizen science and higher ed. And so I'm really speaking to faculty and any other librarians out So we are there to uh, assist and become a part of, you know, not just ordering books anymore. We do uh, research data plans, scholarly communication, copyright, all those things. Uh, so feel free to reach out to your um, academic library if you have a liaison library and see if it's something they can do. And, you know, they, in some circumstances, they may be able to work a little bit more closely, a little bit more deeply with you, uh, as I have. Um, I have worked on a couple of grants with Darlene. Um, we're, we're teaching a citizen science course in the fall. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of levels of, of collaboration that can go on there. I'm very pleased to be speaking to you all today because I had a great experience at the Citizen Science Association Conference last year in Raleigh. It really opened my eyes up. Just want to put in a plug for next year's in Tempe, Arizona at Arizona State University. So keep that in mind. Put it on your calendars. Um, but what I'm showing here is some of the ways that uh, librarians can help out. Here's an example of a, is a screenshot of a library guide that I have at Arizona State on citizen science. And again, library guides can be done for a particular course, particular topic, uh, a way of getting a lot of information in one go-to place from the library. You see here, we've got uh, lots of key people on here. We've got 
Karen's TEDx talk on there, key science organizations, SciStarter and Citizen Science Association, their Twitter feed with, you know, the screenshot was taken when this was being advertised. Lots of places uh, were, were getting information out there. Um, we also circulate resources. That was one of the things when Darlene and I first started talking about citizen science about four years ago, you know, issues with uh, getting equipment or tools out to people who want to do citizen science. Citizen, uh, libraries check things out. They check out all kinds of things now. You can put things on course reserve. Um, you know, you can work other things out that way uh, if you need to uh, through citizen science. We also are, again, as we are involved in the, the research life cycle, you know, we can help out with project curation. Uh, there are over 3,000 uh, projects on SciStarter. Uh, we can help work with you depending on what it is you want to do with your learning outcomes, things like that. Uh, work on narrowing down uh, projects that you might be able to use. We've done that with the College of Health Solutions here at Arizona State University. We've done that with the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Um, so that's a, a way we can help work together, make it a little easier for you and, and get you some good projects that you can share how you wish with your courses. Um, we also are involved in science literacy. Now, I am not a scientist. I have an undergraduate religion degree, uh, but I am really into uh, citizen science and the ability to do it. So there is a association of college and research libraries as part of the American Library Association. And information literacy is one of their uh, big pillars. And again, it's you know being able to identify the need for information, procure the information, evaluate the information and revise a strategy for obtaining information and to use the information, use it in an ethical and a legal manner and encourage lifelong learning. You know, science, what's going on now, we realize it's a, a great need for science literacy. Uh, and that is something that we do. Other things we have are we have ties to other kinds of libraries through uh, library associations, things like that. Um, if you want to reach other segments of the, our communities, there's school libraries, public libraries, special libraries, which may have, you know, specialized uh, resources, things like that. That's another way that we can help kind of bridge those gaps. And then also groups. Uh, Karen had mentioned the Citizen Science Campus at NC State. They've got a great uh, student group there, undergraduate student group that promotes citizen science, does the projects. They're all kind of self-motivated. They uh, meet every week. It's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. And that's something that, you know, you might want to get going on your campus, as well as some kind of a, we at ASU, we had a monthly meeting of a citizen science network, kind of informal way for people who are interested, researchers interested in doing citizen science to get together, talk about information, maybe workshop some projects that they're working on, uh, things like that. We had a monthly meeting. So those are some of the ways that we're doing it. I would also like to say that there are a lot of academic librarians I've been in touch with who are interested in citizen science and interested in how they can approach faculty with citizen science as uh, an opportunity for faculty to take it on uh, and contribute to that. So if you have any ideas in that, feel free to uh, let me know and I will pass it along to Caroline. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. All right. Hey, everybody. I'll keep this um, a little brief because I know that we have lots of happy hours coming up and other events where you can join us to hear about these resources. But I'm Caroline Nickerson from the SciStarter team. So excited to be here and be talking to you all today. Um, so on SciStarter, we um, want you to be able to find the resources you need and we want to meet you where you are. So you know, you don't have to know everything about citizen science and you don't have to be an expert or have a lot of resources to be able to implement it in your classroom right now. And I know a lot of you have pivoted to online learning and you might be online in the fall. We can meet you where you are there too. So you can use the SciStarter project finder, scistarter.org forward slash finder to find the right project for your community. So you can search by location, subject, grade level, including college, and more. 
Um, and then you might be wondering, how can I make sure that my students have done this project? How can I get evidence of participation? Your students can make SciStarter accounts, and for SciStarter affiliates, and you can actually use that filter on the finder, you can um, have them track the number and frequency of their contributions um, to these SciStarter affiliates. And then, of course, as Karen was saying, you know, you want to make sure that they're um, contributing quality data, that they're really taking this seriously. We recommend, you know, communicating one-on-one -on -one with that, but I think the SciStarter dashboard is a great place to aggregate everything um, across projects. So if you wanted to assign multiple projects to your class. Um, and we also recommend going to SciStarter.org forward slash education. At the bottom, you'll find the college level projects, the ones that we think would be a great fit for different college classrooms. Um, and those projects, um, we selected them in part because they're really great about reporting back results. So stall catchers is the example I go back to again and again. If you look at their blog, they'll tell you from this data set, we found that exercise um, did not reduce the number of stalled um, blood vessels in my mouse brains infected with Alzheimer's disease. You know, they'll tell you what the data um, you classified with other citizen scientists, what it actually did for research, which I find really valuable. So I recommend looking at those projects on SciStarter.org forward slash education um, to find projects that are, I think are particularly good at communicating back results, though there are so many great projects on SciStarter and I urge you to explore them all with the finder. On that SciStarter.org forward slash education page, at the very bottom, um, there are also discussion questions. Um, those were written by um, educators um, from Broward County Schools and North Carolina State University, who both have portals with SciStarter. And those questions, I think, um, are kind of ready-made to address any sort of citizen science project and any project where a student's doing real research, you know, in the community with the outer world. And my last point is, um, we just um, ended Citizen Science Month. We're in Citizen Science Year now, but um, throughout April, we did a number of webinars, how-to videos, um, ask me anything sessions um, on the SciStarter YouTube and just on Zoom with um, different uh, project leaders and citizen science people. So we urge you to check out our videos page if you wanna um, kind of do a deeper dive and embed media, because I always think like, some of the best learning can be done outside the classroom, right? It's when students are doing the citizen science and maybe when they really, you know, catch the citizen science bug and they want to watch these videos on their own. This is a place where you can kind of direct them and where they could hear from the project scientists directly in a number of different webinar formats. Um, so thank you so much everyone for the work you do and for everyone who's on this webinar, please don't be scared. Just start where you're at and, um, you know, even if it's just one project you have your students do, or maybe you tell them, maybe give it a try optionally, and then we can discuss your experience. That's great too. Um, there are all different levels and they're all great. So thank you so much.